Welcome to this video on a brief introduction to our new topic as well as a um, going over of plate tectonics. Today we're going to look at continental drift and our plate boundaries that exist on our planet as well as some of the types of zones um, of when two tectonic plates meet. And towards the end we'll start to look at how this all links to New Zealand and putting it into a New Zealand context. So before we start Here's a little brief introduction of a few of the things that we've already covered and how they all link together. So, here we've got some cogs, and each cog represents a different sphere or element of our planet. Now, the two main elements of our planet, we've obviously got the geological side of things, the Earth side of things, and the stuff that sort of surrounds that um, rock and landmass and oceans, which is our hydrospheres and atmospheres. Now, all of these will eventually link and affect each other in interesting ways. But what drives them initially is two sources of heat. So the primary source of heat that affects our atmosphere and our oceans is going to be through the sun and the amount of energy that our sun gives off that drives these two spheres. And over here on um, the Earth side of things, we've got obviously the intense internal heat um, that will manipulate the outer crust that we'll look at in a second. So, how does the atmosphere and hydrosphere link together? Well, that's through the addition of the water cycle. The water cycle is how these two interact and link. Secondly, we've got plate tectonics coming into play. Now, plate tectonics are um, our crust moving uh, around and constantly changing. And it does that in a couple of ways. The water cycle is also linked to weather and erosion, and the weather and erosion constantly will affect um, the solid earth part of the uh, cogs in our diagram. As I alluded to before, we've got plate tectonics, and plate tectonics are affected by two cogs, that is our crustal movements, so this idea of continental drift, and the constant recycling of our plates um, as they melt and uh, cool and are constantly being recycled. As we all know, our landscape constantly changes. We see this happen um, you know, over time. Uh, so this evolution of our landscape is linked to the crust that is currently um, in our point in time available to be manipulated by the cogs on the left here. And finally, the rock cycle is this recycling of plates as they are subducted, melted, and um, spat back out at new zones and form new uh, land masses. Finally, if you know anything about the sort of creation of Earth, you'll know that uh, what is in space had a massive impact, um, especially in the early formation of our planet, and things like celestial objects, meteors, um, comets, and uh, asteroids, all impacting Earth have a massive effect, as well as a few um, significant uh, events throughout its history that have caused life to undergo drastic changes. So this, in a nutshell, is going to be our topic that we will look at, starting with the solid part of Earth and just going through what manipulates, how it works, and leading into these two spheres over here. So here's another diagram of those spheres, putting it in a bit more of a sort of image other than the cogs, so we've obviously got all water in terms of its uh, hydrosphere. Um, here you can see the constant cycling of this water with um, the water cycle. Our atmosphere is obviously everything to do with the atmosphere surrounding our planet. That's, these two drastically affect the biospheres that are available. The geosphere is the constant changing of our landscape, which in turn also affects our biospheres, determining what can grow and live um, in those zones. So, today we're going to focus in this sphere particularly, our geosphere. These four are constantly interacting, and a change in one sphere will result in the change in another, so it's important that we just highlight that these all interact. Extreme Earth events are caused by these interactions of some or all of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere and biospheres. A quick example is that heavy rain or, uh, affects both our atmosphere and hydrosphere and that can cause landslides or the erosion of our geosphere. If trees have been cut down and their roots were uh, holding fast a hillside, 
that can also lead to the manipulation of the geosphere and the slip will be far more serious if that deluge does affect it. So here we have the Earth's surface out in sort of a laid out flat map. Now we think of continents as um, you know political countries. It's not actually quite the case in the geology side of things. So as um, I'm talking you'll start seeing some of these interesting names pop up if you want to pause the video here and have a crack at naming some of them. I've included um, two that you might not know the um, uh, names of here and here but have a quick look and see if you can think of what this one might be over here um, as I'm giving you a little bit more information. So, the Earth's surface is broken up into several tectonic plates. Each colour above is different, a different tectonic plate. The arrows show directional movement of these plates and they're made up of a crust on the upper layer of the mantle and we'll go um, through some of the layers of the planet soon. Movement of these causes volcanoes, earthquakes and tsunamis and also shapes the surface of the Earth forming land features like the big mountain ranges that we know and the deep ocean trenches and basins. So, how do we know that these plates exist? Well, I'm going to take on a little bit of a history lesson um, as we go um, to just understand how we initially thought these were fixed land masses. We thought, you know, North America had always been there, Africa had always been there, and as we sort of developed our understanding of science and um, investigation, we started to uncover some interesting things that sort of led us to different thoughts about that. Um, one of the sort of really first early signs um, actually began uh, when scientists recognized odd magnetic variations across the ocean floor when using devices that were developed in the Second World War to detect um, submarines. And during the Cold War and things, this sort of ocean mapping became a lot more um, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the magnetization patterns were not anomalies, um, as it had originally been supposed. And there was a series of papers between 1959 and 1963 um, that collectively realized that this magnetization of the ocean floor was formed extensively in zebra-like patterns. It would be one stripe would exhibit the normal polarity, and then the adjoining stripe would be the reverse polarity. And the best explanation that was come up for this was the conveyor belt hypothesis, um, which was that new magma was forming deep within the Earth. And um, as that rose through the weak points in the zones, uh, it eventually erupted out um, along the crest of the ridges to create new oceanic crust. The new crust is magnetized by the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the Earth, we know, undergoes occasional reversals of that magnetic field, and therefore the formation of the new crust displaces the magnetized crust apart, kind of like a conveyor belt, hence the name. So what they were looking at was something that looked a bit like this. So you can see here our normal polarity in these sort of orangey-red colors, and then the reverse polarity um, in the white. Now you'll discover soon that it takes you know, hundreds of millions of years for new crust to, to move. It moves about an inch a year. So in terms of geological time scale, we're not looking at this happening next year or the year after. It's gradual change. So when a new crust starts erupting and the magnetic field has reversed, there's a significant amount of time for new crust to develop, hence these stripes being formed. And here you can actually see some of the strips from the sea floor um, being uh, displayed here. So, evidence for the movement of the continents on the tectonic plates is now extensive. So that was sort of back uh, in the, from the 1940s onwards. Um, and similar, an, uh, another uh, huge um, load of evidence for plate tectonic movement came in the form of plant and animal fossils. And the fact that similar ones were found around the shores of different continents, um, which suggested that they were once joined so here you can see our current sort of shapes of our continents um, as they exist today and some examples of some fossils. So um, one of the famous ones, the Mesosaurus, is a freshwater reptile, um, rather like a small crocodile, um, this one here. And 
it uh, was found both in Brazil and, and South Africa. Now, a freshwater organism, as you know, if you've done any biology, um, would find it extremely difficult to cross a saltwater ocean. So um, there are a number of other examples. Um, as you can see here, uh, plants being found all over uh, the place. Plants is slightly different that if they're pollination, they may be able to, and seed dispersal methods, they may be able to travel quite a far distance. But when we're seeing terrestrial animals that could not possibly cross the oceans that we have today, we started to think, hmm, these continents didn't used to be where they used to be where they are today. But what is causing this to happen and how does it happen? So I've told you that these plates are moving and there's evidence for that. But actually, you know, what is going on that's causing all of this movement? Um, we've got a little video here um, that was off a documentary. It's just a, a very short clip that I'll play you, showing you in quite um, dramatized fashion the movement of our mantle. And that's what we're going to look at um, now. Before we move on to that, however, we're just going to look at the Earth and its different layers. So as the, the Earth was forming, it was constantly being bombarded um, by the remnants of our star um, it's forming and exploding. So there's lots of stuff in, our, um, in its orbital path that it's sort of consuming as it gets bigger, more gravity pulls more objects in. And um, lots of different elements from our periodic table were being absorbed as well. These um, elements, the heavier ones, would sink into the um, middle of our planet, into its core. So you often find a lot heavier elements like um, lead um, there, whereas there's lighter elements like silicon and oxygen started rising to the surface. And at the very topmost surface, once we've got through our mantle, you'll see this crust forming. And if any of you have left a um, milky drink out for too long, you'll notice a crust or a skin forming on the top based on the temperature change. So this sort of uh, inner part of our planet is very, very um, you know, hot, high pressure um, and liquid, whereas up here, exposed to space in our atmosphere, it cools significantly and our ocean plays a part in that as well. And uh, here you can see some of the depths that we're talking about. Um, if you've ever seen some of the movies that try and get to the centre of the Earth, um, it's quite a big distance to try and um, get through. So. As you go down each meter, you can see uh, it's sort of, uh, every 100 meters it decreases by uh, increases by one degree um, in temperature. And at the very core, we're looking at sort of the temperatures um, close to that of the surface of the sun. So pretty intense down there. And this is what that sort of video was showing you that obviously the inner and uh, cores here are cores and heat are um, through radioactive decay the movement of the mantle. And this we can, um, you'll see in a few ex ex uh, experiments that we do in class, this is a common um, chemistry and physical uh, phenomena in, in science that heating, heat rises, and when it's cooled, um, it sinks. So this constant recycling causes anything solid on the surface to obviously be moved and taken with it. So we're gonna look into this in a little bit more detail um, soon. Here is our planet, um, focusing on the Pacific, as obviously that's where we are um, at the moment. And you can see that these plates are a bit like a jigsaw. You saw that in the colored picture a couple of slides back. And it's these boundaries that are um, what we're going to be focusing on. And particularly, you can see here in New Zealand, if you hadn't spotted it, beneath one of these boundaries here, um, causes massive, massive um, extreme events to occur because if you imagine these are two land masses, this entire plate moving towards this entire plate, and that's gonna have some repercussions that we will look at soon now. So as above, you can see some of these, we've got these words like convergent, divergent, transform plate boundaries that you saw in the previous map. Um, so what do those mean? Well, there are a number of different types of plate boundary, and uh, they include uh, three main types, as I discussed up here. So the first one we've got here is when the two plates, due to the convection currents under here, are being pulled apart, which leaves a big zone in the middle that is weakened and allows magma um, from the mantle liquid um, rock to spill out and create new land masses. 
So this is what we know as a, a divergent plate boundary. Uh, the second one we looked at um, was that sort of um, lateral movement of two plates when they hit together and sort of move past each other. This one causes a lot of earthquakes happening and as you can see here um, will shift things like rivers and roads and stuff like that that were on the um, fault line there. And finally we've got the uh, convergent plate boundaries where two plates are heading towards each other and actually smash into one another. Now this forces uh, forms three different types of boundary but the most common one is the subduction zone where one plate will go under another and this causes multiple things like earthquakes along um, the contact points here and the melting plates will cause a lot of pressure to build up underneath the plate. So here you can see the other types of convergent plate boundary. So I talked here about uh, this one where we've got an oceanic um, crust subducting under a continental crust. Continental crusts tend to be a lot thicker and um, obviously bigger so that the smaller, lighter crust will dip underneath um, the bigger one. And the second type we have is an oceanic subducting under another oceanic crust. Um, and finally, we've got uh, a collision zone where two will con collide quite um, aggressively, two continental plates forming massive um, mountain ranges to be formed, places like the Himalayas and uh, also um, the Grand Canyon being uplifted 7,000 metres up into the air above sea level. It's quite amazing. So New Zealand, as I sort of showed you a couple of slides back, is across um, multiple plate boundaries. And it actually covers right round here, as you can see on this diagram, um, through the South Island and down the bottom here. And we actually see different types of plate boundaries. And we have, um, we'll explore those in a little bit more detail in the next video. Um, but you can clearly see through these cool satellite um, images of the different types of plates, and you can clearly see different underlying sea ridges. Um, and obviously the mountain ranges of the Southern Alps are all caused by these two plates hitting each other. So what two plates do we have that um, contact New Zealand? Well, it straddles the plate boundary between the Australian and the Pacific plates. The boundary includes um, the Kermadec Trench to the north and the Pisegra, excuse the um, pronunciations, trench to the south. The Pacific plate is moving towards the Australian plate at about three to six centimeters a year, um, and you know that's sort of the, roughly the same um, speed that your fingernails grow. So you can see here um, in this diagram, it shows we've got oceanic crust and um, continental crust around New Zealand, and that will dictate what plate boundary and what's happening at those boundaries um, to occur. So the land is always are continental and the continental shelf around New Zealand is this sort of orangey red um, colour. Uh, the green, aqua and blue are the oceanic crust. And as you can see, um, and it was in the news I think uh, last year or the year before, that New Zealand used to be a much larger landmass when um, the ice caps were a lot larger and took up a lot more of our water. So you could actually walk easily between the two islands um, and all of this was continent. Here's just a, a little bit more um, detail showing, again, the two oceanic and continental crusts. Um, and you see here these two arrows. And in the next video, we'll look in a lot more detail about what's happening um, at certain zones. But what's quite cool is up here, you see we've got the subduction of our Pacific plate um, under our Australasian plate. And as we go along here, we see that we've got this collision and lateral movement between um, the two continental parts of the um, respective crusts. And then down here, we actually see the reverse, that suddenly, the um, because we've got this big continental shelf here, that the Austra Australasian plate is now subducting underneath the Pacific plate. So you get this switch happening at the Southern Alps. And as you can imagine, that switch there is what's causing a lot of the recent um, extreme events that happen in our country. And just one more cool uh, sort of picture that, again, just adds that extra layer of detail and shows you some of the hot zones around New Zealand. Um, 
is this diagram here. So, you know, the highlighted here is our sort of Taupo um, volcanic plateau, um, you know, sort of our big volcanoes that we visited last year and you will visit in this course. Uh, we've got Taranaki over there. We'll look at that one um, separately. Obviously, Auckland up here has a hot spot um, as well. And down here, we've got the big alpine fault that sort of spreads up and comes into Wellington as well a little bit. So we've got a lot of activity here, obviously, in Christchurch, um, Sidon, and um, Kaikoura. Lots of activity happening down there. So we'll fully unpack why we had all those extreme events. So I think that's probably enough um, for today. So today we have looked at the following. We've started to unpack why we think the continents move and what evidence there is to uh, suggest that our plates are constantly in motion. Um, you had a bit of an introduction on how the, all the spheres of our planet are, are interlinked, and we'll look at lots of those. And um, we've started to explore how New Zealand is a great example of some of these types of plate boundaries and the different collision zones that these plates um, exhibit when they come into contact with each other. We'll unpack how and what the effects are of these plate tectonics in the next video. So I hope you've learned a lot, and I look forward to discussing this with you in class. Thanks for listening.